funky politics. Funky Politics Education Reform Series is presented by the National Civil Rights Museum, sponsored by Memphis Education Fund and Southwest Tennessee Community College. We'd like to thank our media partner, Chalkbeat Tennessee. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. In our studio this evening, we've got Yetta Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Gestalt Community Schools, and Marcus Robinson, CEO of the Memphis Education Fund. And also, you got DC here, and you got Doc Ward sitting in, just trying to keep some conversation going, talking about what's important. Well, we do want to keep it going. I mean, this is important stuff, and I, I and I want to kind of I want to split this at him one more time because we we've been talking about education, but let's be clear on something and tell me if I'm not not right. You're not right. The issue. <laughs> yeah, man, you just, you're, you're not right. Though. Well, Go ahead. Yeah, that's because I'm hanging with you. But at any rate, it's not about what we're talking about here as the issue of education, for the most part, is dealing with the intersection of education and poverty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we're not just talking about education as a whole being an issue because if you've got plenty of resources and plenty of capital and plenty of exposure and plenty of, uh, of people and support systems, this conversation doesn't necessarily apply to you. But for the other 99% of us, you know, this is the issue that we're talking about, right? It's right. more or less how do you, the, the intersection of poverty and education, and not just necessarily those that are just well below the poverty line, but just the systems themselves, the public school systems mm-hmm. being short on resources. How are you able to affect still the number of kids that require and lean on public education uh, and need it? require as opposed to private education that that's what we're talking about right right so uh the intersection of poverty mm-hmm. and the school system has been an age-old situation in 2011 here we had 85 schools that were in the bottom five percent in the state wow. majority all in memphis when you look at that those schools and the communities that the children are in, high poverty communities. Mm -hmm. So what we clearly understood and are understanding now in this ed reform movement is education alone is not the panacea. That you really have to have a a community effort um, to tackle poverty, to end generational poverty, to give kids access when they did not have access uh, to not only quality teachers, but resources and experiences within their community. So education, but also what's going on in community development, housing, job opportunities, Um, The composite of a community and at the heart of every community is a great school. When you build great schools, they will come, right? You will have middle, upper class, and um, our uh, lower high poverty class all together because they're great schools there. Let me ask you this question because you all are are winning the fight. I, I, I consider that winning the fight at Gestalt. And, and how in the world, in, in a community right in Memphis, uh, the Hickory Hill area, I know was is one of those target areas right. that, that you were part of for some, some years now. How are you all, and I'm assuming that you, did, you had wraparound services where you could bring people in and not only just address the educational uh, performance of, of, of low-performing schools and the, uh, children, but also you had to step in with the poverty issue. Where it, Tell me what y'all did. Yeah. How, how did mean, you win this fight? So And you're winning. I think we're still in the fight, yeah. right? But you're, but still, you're winning. We're still recruiting numbers. soldiers. We're yeah. still recruiting uh, no, soldiers. I think, I think you know, they're, they're, as you said, we're still in the fight. You're yeah. not giving up the fight. No, no. Yeah, they're winning, yeah. though. Yeah I, don't, yeah. I don't I don't know, man. So, I mean, it's, my, it's like Mosul, man. It looks like a victory. <laughs> oh, God. It looks like Mosul. Oh, until, no. until it looks it's, like a victory until the next wave comes along. Right. And you have to prepare for the next wave. So it's not just educators at the table with the Gestalt schools. Um, We work with the city of Memphis. So in our work in Hickory Hill, we have a great partnership with Power Center CDC, run out of New Direction. And they focused on housing. Like how do we get over the housing plight? Um, How do we also build entrepreneurs in the community? And we had the audacious hope to say, hey, we can start very early 
in a child's educational journey in building entrepreneurship, financial literacy. So we had that base of education. We also looked at partnerships. Um, Purchase the Marina Cove um, property, which those of you who are from Memphis know, it was over 300 blighted apartment buildings, right. uh, drugs, just the eyesore in Hickory well, they, were, they were vacant. They were vacant. They were vacant. Right. It was an out-of-state landlord that wasn't taking care of the property in the community. Um, we were able to acquire that and really build out a vision. And now we have partnerships with church, local government, as well as Habitat for Humanity to build housing. Uh, right now, we have 10 houses that are being built for students and families that are in our schools. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazukia Network. In our studio this evening, we've got Yetta Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Gestalt Community Schools, and Marcus Robinson, CEO of the Memphis Education Fund. And, and Dr. Robinson, one question for you, because it appears that in your long years of service in, in the education reform model, that at Tenley Accelerated School System, you did some of the same things. Sure. Uh, and, and can you give us a little bit about what, what you did in Indianapolis that, that became uh, a win-win for the parents and for the students? Yeah. Um, yeah first and foremost, I think you, you have to set uh, really high expectations for everybody involved, um, high academic expectations for kids, high expectations around instruction for teachers, high expectations around participation for families. And by participation, I'm not talking about coming to the school and volunteering, I'm just talking about, I just need you to be engaged, ask this child what they're doing with their homework, et cetera. And so I don't refer to kids as underprivileged, I refer to them as under-resourced. And so whatever the resource hole is, you plug it, which is to say, if a child does not have decent clothes to wear to school, because we have a school uniform, I will buy you the clothes. If you don't have a washing machine to wash them, I'll wash them for you. If you don't have food to eat, we'll put a book bag full of food together. We'll send it home with you in a way that doesn't embarrass you in front of your peers. You don't have transportation to activities, we'll get you from your house. We'll bring you to the activity. We'll take you home. And so what I tried to create within the school context is the best of inner city schools that I experienced as a child, as well as the best of community centers and church organizations that I experienced as a child. So you, if you can see the school as a community-based center, not only is a family able to access education, but we had a clinic in the school. They could access health care. Um, we had licensed therapists in the school. They can access mental health. Um, we were connected with a local um, social service agency. They can access housing, right? And so more than anything, what you're just doing is trying to figure out, not just what the academic needs are, the, are of the child, but the whole needs of the child. And so the concern that all of us should have is, um, well, it starts at five schools now? Six schools, yeah. Six schools now? Tell me was at six. Wow. We got 70,000 kids. How do you scale it? Wow. Right? Yeah, so, how you- so how do you scale love? Yes. Right? Uh, so that, because when you scale love, what I've discovered is kids are more willing to participate, even when they're dealing with that trauma, even when they are facing tough circumstances. Wow. If they believe in this schoolhouse, there is somebody who expects me to pull my pants up, I'm going to pull my pants up. Yeah. In this schoolhouse, there's somebody who, if I don't walk in here with this homework, they don't give me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and tell me to sit my high parts in that chair and don't move until it gets done. Those are the kinds of things that ingratiate you into a community. There's a, there's a school network in Chicago called um, the United Neighborhood Organization. They start off as a community social service agency serving largely Hispanic uh, population. They started schools to support their families. And then when the families started sending their kids to their schools, they started a custodial service, a food service agency, and a number of other things to employ the parents, right? And so the school became a valued place and the the kids participate in the school in a different way and so the thing that we have to contemplate is not necessarily you know how can we bring 5,000 more jobs to yeah, to our right. community because that's going to provide the economic lift yeah. the thing we have to <clears throat> contemplate is how do we need to resituate 
these schools as not just places where we drive academics, but as places where we, we drive good citizenship. Well, let me ask you, a district like DPS, Dallas Public Schools, you got you got H, HISD, Houston yeah. Independent School, you got all of these large districts that yeah. apparently are moving the needle. Are they adapting some of those types of models? And if that's the case, then you got districts like the Shelby County District in Memphis, and then you got the uh, the Na- uh, Nashville Metro sure. District in Nashville. Too. Do we need to look at some of the best practices from around the country? Here's what I'm talking smart, about the government districts. Here's what the, smart public. superintendents are figuring out. Mm-hmm. This is not about, to Yetta's point, finding a silver bullet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But how do we create a menu of services to provide for our families? Right. And so some of those answers are going to come from the district. For instance, Shelby County Schools has one of the best turnaround shops in the country, right? Um, they decided to do that as a district to support the lowest performing schools in the district. So some of those innovations will come from the district. But the smart superintendent is saying, well, listen, Yetta, if you could do great work in Hickory Hill, can can I entice you to come just a little bit over to Whitehaven and do some more of that work? Yeah, and so they're creating a portfolio of services that are moving the needle. Um, we're seeing it in Indianapolis. You're seeing it in Houston. Yeah. And so the the smartest superintendents are starting to say, "This is not a battle we're going to win just fighting the same way. We have to entice these entrepreneurs to the table right. to bring different kinds of services to our kids." Now, the even the brilliant superintendents are not just inviting <coughs> entrepreneurs to the table; they're stealing from them. Wow. Yeah, and so if I were superintendent, so I'd bring Yetta into one of my schools, and i put cameras up all over the place. i record her when she wasn't looking except in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> and I would steal all that stuff, and I would take it to a different school. I think that's sort of going to be the next level of district-level um, innovation as folks say, look, let me get this smart practice and expand it. Yep. The great thing is, Mark, is you don't have to really steal <coughs> resources, right? Because there are folks that are willing to give those resources out be, for the betterment of every kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's ultimately um, a higher purpose in education that if you have something that works, you have, we say, a moral ob- obligation to share that. That was the reason why Gestalt is growing because there's something that's working. We don't have all the answers, but we know these strategic partnerships are are meeting the needs of the community. And then we're open to sharing that with anyone who wants to hear it. So how do we get that message out? So there are small um, organizations all across the nation that are doing great work in cities that they're not getting a platform to really get this out to larger districts that may need those resources. There are larger districts that are knocking it out of the box that smaller rural communities can't have access to. What are they doing right now with personalized learning and unschooling school, making kids that would have dropped out five years ago um, out of school and middle school really coming back and wanting to come to school. What are they doing? So there's some great innovative practices, but we're not all on the same page with those practices. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. In our studio this evening, we've got Yetta Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Gestalt Community Schools, and Marcus Robinson, CEO of the Memphis Education Fund. That's my issue. We are not on the same page. And if the child is the focus, if bringing up those boats, we've talked about it for dozens and dozens of years, all boats rising. Yeah. If you can't get the least of that, I mean, wh- then then why? 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 Why do we have a district that has 180 buildings <laughs> and you have, at some of those buildings, you've got 20, 25, 30% of capacity? And it, if it's not working, then we need to do something different. And well, maybe, that's, maybe that's what this education that's reform a, that's is. That's a bigger situation. Well, no, no, no. Excuse me? That's a bigger situation. This, this is, situation. it has all of this to do with it. It has, a, that's a bigger situation. Sure. Though. Sure. I mean, because if you're talking about not enough people to be in the buildings, that's population. That, that's, that's population issue. Yeah, that that means, then, then, that then means you're doing that, what the district superintendent in Memphis is doing right now. He is recommending that he that he shrink the district. That's what he's doing. And he, and he may need to shrink. The no district. doubt he does. He may. Yeah. Need, I mean, for a lot no of reasons. I mean, but that deals with geography and placement of people and everything else. But the bigger part of it is, name me one. Name me one school that you know of that has the numbers quite low. And it's a high-performing school, and they're talking about closing it down. Name me one school. 
Well, I'm not going to well, think so. Well, uh, cannot... wait a minute. Wait, you can't just do that because, I mean, what you're doing is what people. Name me one. Well, what you're doing right now is what, what? people that don't have a lot of understanding do. You're just, oh, you're just turning your head. I see. Name me a school. To, oh, it's not, it's, but it's bigger than that. Oh, because well, no. I don't have a lot of understanding. You're oh, right. oh, excuse me for excuse oh, me for talking while you're interrupting. But at any rate. Um, <laughs> That's why this is funky politics, y'all, by really the way. Funky. Yeah. It's but, funky up in here. We don't mind, but, but, we don't but, mind but, getting funky with each what, other. What, what, <laughs> but, but, but we don't mind being funky. But remember, our motto is being real and right. So oh, you're, and you're no, missing those no, two. No, no. You have a community. If you're talking about Memphis, Tennessee, and maybe Jackson, Mississippi, and some of these other cities. You don't have a lot of population because the cities are not attractive for people to move to. They're not attractive. Hmm. And if and, and they're not attractive because you really don't have a sense of there being an investment in the citizenry. You know, if you look at what the overall wages are of, of the people, if you look at the communities, we have so many wonderful communities in the Memphis area where there's no one living in those communities. Sure. Because there is no... There, there's not enough wealth being spread around to uplift those communities. If you come to Memphis to go work for FedEx, mm-hmm. you are not going to be taken by a real estate agent to Orange Mound no. or to South Memphis or to Fresh. But there are plenty of houses, yeah, but no one's going to take you there because of the whole perception you're going to go out east. So everything's kind of just shifting in or one place. South. But but I would agree with D.C. that even if you had a building that was unsubscribed, mm-hmm. right, it's, it's, it's under-enrolled, but it's high-performing. Nobody's gonna touch that building. But if it's under enrolled, chances are it's under enrolled because that community has deteriorated down to the studs where you don't have enough people there that are going to have it be high performing. Carver High School was down to four hundred students or something like yeah, that. The numbers were low. But the number of students that I'm, could go to I'm Carver not, I'm not arguing against closure. Yeah. What what I'm suggesting is at at some point our demand um for schooling should be connected with a certain level of excellence. Absolutely. And I am concerned as somebody who um, studies this nationally that there's not enough people storming the Bastille about quality education, which is to say not only do we have practitioners who don't believe poor black kids can learn, we have whole communities of taxpayers yeah. who are not necessarily convinced that they can learn. We wouldn't deal with that in any other context. If we had a hospital for the indigent and people walked in but they never walked out, right, yeah. we want it shut down. That's right. Even if I don't particularly go to that hospital, the fact that people die in there all the time would concern me as a citizen and the taxpayer. We let our kids die slow death in these schools that rob them True. of hope and possibility. Wow. And so at some point, our conversation tends not to be about quality. I want excellent schools. And if we don't want excellent schools, then we don't want an excellent community. But how can you but, provide excellence with low resources because yes, the community is deteriorating? How there, can you do there that? Is a, there is a definite tie right. with the educational program and the type of resources that you can provide. Um, so clearly naming a school that is high performing with right. uh, <laughs> low enrollment, that's a little frutal, um for our <laughs> expectations. You, you the, the issue is that when you do not have that particular population, even when you come to the table with right. high quality measures, you're now making trade-offs for that community. You're saying that, oh, maybe I can't have arts for the kids in this zip code because I'm losing. Maybe I can't have a another AP teacher because I just don't have enough enrollment. There's some definite trade-offs that are, are being made that should not for the communities that we serve with the low population. So there's some hard decisions that are being made where the superintendent is working on a new blueprint to give the best of the best to kids in the community, a full right. educational program, not right. a half. Right. I mean, and you've got resources like that. I think there are schools in the area where you had, there's one school in particular that had, you know, a dry cleaning, full service dry yeah. cleaning area, full uh, 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 professional auto, auto mechanic. Com- commercial kitchen, auto mechanic, everything. Yeah. It's not being used because you don't have the population there to keep the to keep the services operating. Now, but, there are a number I, of innovative strategies. Before you get to those, yeah. there are some innovative strategies that could be uh, exerted by the foundations and other nonprofits to get those places opened up and get yeah. people in them. Yeah. But that's an area outside of the norm for education. That's going to require a little more work. So it becomes a challenge. 
So it's bigger than, and I just want to reiterate the point, it's not about closure. Mm. Closure is the end result. Mm. What I'm talking about is what it took to get you there because a lot of that is wrapped up in what we're talking about because at the end of the day, it sounds to me like everything that you guys are doing is great. The reality of it is you're, you're, you're packaging up things that we learned as children of the 70s when we still had these communities intact sure. and you're making sure. a science out of it sure. and it's becoming it's manifesting into all of these wonderful yeah. organizations well, but, but of understand excellence. that for kids of privilege mm-hmm. they've never been without it and some kids that didn't have privilege right. growing up because the communities sure. were centralized sure. when but, you had but, community decentralization but that, my point is we have to be careful about resource allocation mm-hmm. divorce from mindset which is to say there are communities there are cities in this country where they spend upwards of $23,000 per student, right. and the schools are still horrific, mm. right? Wow. And so under the circumstances, my, my deal is mm-hmm. like, that has to be a mindset shift. We have to see um, teaching as practice and not art. I can train you to be a great teacher. You don't have to come out of your mama's womb yeah. right. ready to be a great lecturer. I can train you for that. And because I can train you for it, then I can demand it as a citizen. I'm not sending my kid to some school where people can't teach. But can it be a little bit of both? No, sir. It can't be, can be science no, and sir. art? No. no, sir. No, sir. It is not science and art. I think the it's, art is kind of what makes teachers. It, it group. is a skill. You can get just a like, good teacher on science, but the great teachers got the science and the art. It's like but, politics but, everything. But think about it in terms of other professions, right? Right. Do you have to be born a great actor? If that were true, there wouldn't be a Yale School of Drama. They train in great actors. That's correct. Right? They train and so yeah. when it comes to, to teaching, I think sometimes we give schools a pass they don't deserve. Mm. Wow. Right? And, wow. and we only give passes to the schools where our kids don't go. The wow. school where my kid goes has to be accountable. Help me understand the C yeah. that you sit on. Help me understand what you did. I know what he did. Help me understand what you did, right? And so I, my point is, and that's not to knock people who are who are working hard, but you could be working hard in the wrong direction. You rowing upstream. And so what I need you to understand is when you go into my classroom mm-hmm. full of black children, you need to feel like they are, have the same opportunity to be successful that a school with a classroom full of white kids might have. And I'm I'm saying to you, as a practitioner, mm-hmm. I don't always see that. And not just from white teachers. I've seen some black teachers who walk into a schoolroom full Help of black kids and lower their expectations. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. So there has to be a mindset shift as well as a resource. I'm sure. This is Funky Politics powered by the Kazuki Network. We have been funking it up here today, folks. Let me tell you right now. In our studio this evening, we have got... Ooh, Yella Lewis, who is the CEO and co-founder of Gestalt Community Schools, and Marcus Robinson, CEO of Memphis Education Fund. This is DC and Doc Ward talking to you about a great opportunity available for you at Southwest Tennessee Community College. You can get a business degree. You can open doors to a wide range of opportunities. Engineering and information technicians are in demand to help power manufacturing and logistics. And paralegal studies, man, those majors are in big demand right now. Register now for spring classes starting January 17th. Call 901-333-4399. A wide range of programs for the most in-demand careers are just another reason. Southwest Tennessee Community College is your best choice. In Memphis, there are 116,000 very important young minds. 20,000 of them attend schools in the bottom 5%. The Memphis Education Fund partners with committed organizations to give these students access to an equitable education. Their partners work to operate quality schools, recruit, retain, and develop effective teachers and leaders, ensure community voice, and support the needs of the whole child in Shelby County's priority schools. This is the story of a great people, of hopes and dreams, of challenge and change. It's an American story. The story and struggle that started many centuries ago lives today in the halls and on the walls of the renovated National Civil Rights Museum. Enter the Supreme Court Halls of Justice, sit with Rosa Parks on the Montgomery bus, hear Mahalia Jackson sing at the March on Washington. Plan now to visit the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. For more information, log on to civilrightsmuseum.org.